Welcome to Unit 6. This is the second to last unit in the course, and it's the first of two units where we explore using integrals to answer different kinds of questions. In particular, the big idea behind this unit is if we know a rate function, what can we fairly assume about the original quantity? For example, you may know that there have been recent rises and falls in the gas price, the amount of money you pay at the, at the pump. And you may also know from your econ class that the amount we pay is related to the supply of oil, or how much oil is being produced and refined in other places. So you and I don't necessarily know on a day-to-day -day basis how much oil there is out there, but we do know the rate at which oil is being sold. And so based on what we see, how the price is changing, we can make certain assumptions about how much oil is being produced, or at least how much oil is being put on the market. That kind of thinking process, kind of thinking backwards about something that's causing something we see, is basically the underlying concept in this unit. There are four main topics, and we'll start with slope fields. By the end of this video, you should be able to sketch a slope field. A slope field looks something like this. They're a little bit strange, but they'll make perfect sense in just a minute. You'll also be able to use those strange-looking graphs to find a solution to an equation where you start with a derivative function. You actually know something about this already. Read the example on the screen and see if you can figure out which of these graphs relates to the situation at hand. Right, so hopefully you realized in this problem we're given information about velocity, in other words the rate at which this runner is running. But what we're asked about is his original position function. The best way to answer the question was probably just to match the slopes that we were given. You probably realized that when they say at two seconds he was traveling zero meters per second, that means that two seconds on the x-axis should correspond to a point that has a slope of zero. And it turns out actually both of these graphs seem to have a zero slope at two seconds. In order to figure out which was the right one, then you probably had to look at the second slope. And if you check five seconds into his run, he's supposed to be traveling in the negative direction at a rate of one meter per second. So on this first position graph, when I go to five seconds and I look up at the actual function, it definitely has a negative slope, but the slope here looks like it's a lot steeper than negative one. It looks like it's maybe negative six or negative seven. The second graph, when you go to five seconds and you look at the slope of that point, that's more reasonably negative one meters per second. And that's why the second graph was the better choice. So this idea of checking slopes, we can use it in a whole range of situations. For example, what if I told you a derivative function? I told you dy dx was 2x minus 1. Can you tell me which of these graphs is the graph of y, the original function? So it turns out there's actually a couple different ways you could have tackled that. I'm guessing that most of you probably tried to find an antiderivative. And maybe you realized that since this is a linear function, if the derivative is a linear function, the original function must have been a parabola, second degree. That makes sense because all of these graphs are parabolas. Maybe you even took an extra step and found the algebraic antiderivative which, if you think about what we did last unit, would be x squared minus x. But then you probably ran into a problem, because none of these graphs is x squared minus x. For example, if I plug in 0 to this function, I should get 0 out, but none of these graphs cross the origin. So you probably got stuck. Well, I want to remind you of what we did just a second ago. In the last example, we used slopes to compare two graphs. You can do the same thing here. Here's what it would look like. Try setting up a t-chart, and we'll pick some random x values. And if you take each of these x values and plug them in to the derivative equation, you're going to come up with a slope. Try that. Awesome. And now the last step would be to check these slopes. In other words, look at each of these graphs. Look at the point where they have an x value of 0 and check whether at that x value of 0, the slope is negative 1. For example, right here, at 0, if I go up, yeah, the graph does look like it has a negative 1 slope. When I look at this graph, it also looks like a negative slope. I'm not really sure if it's negative 1. This looks pretty reasonable, so does that. So check the next one. 
Well, at positive 1, it should have a slope of positive 1. For the first graph, if I go over to positive 1, this function has a negative slope. So this function can't be the antiderivative. We've ruled out the blue graph. Use the rest of the slopes to check. And I want you to guess again, which of these functions do you think is the an antiderivative? Excellent. So maybe that was surprising. It turns out there's two functions that work. There's two functions that both matched all of the slopes we checked. And actually, they'd match all of the slopes you could check, not just the four that we decided to check. This is because any function, any derivative function, has many antiderivatives. And in fact, the reason finding the antiderivative didn't work is because we forgot about the plus c. Every differential equation has a family of antiderivatives. If I give you the equation of the derivative and I ask you to find the original function, you can't. You just don't have enough information because there are infinite functions that all have the same derivative. Those infinite functions aren't just any old function. They're actually all related to each other. Take a look at the graph. What do you notice about these functions? Right, you probably notice that they have the same shape. And it's not just like approximately the same shape. It's actually exactly the same shape. All of these parabolas start with x squared minus x. And the only difference is that they all cross the y-axis at a different number. That number is the c value. It's taking the same parabola and shifting it up or down. So if we're measuring the price of oil and trying to figure out something about oil production or whatever the antiderivative is, knowing just how the oil prices are changing is not enough to know exactly how much oil there is. It could be one of many scenarios. Use this same idea and take this derivative function and sketch a family of functions that could be the original function. Your answer should look something like this one, except it should be the antiderivative of cosine. This is what your answer maybe could have looked like. You probably realize that if the derivative function is cosine, the original function would be sine plus c. In other words, we take the original sine function, which could be one antiderivative, and we can find all the other antiderivatives by shifting that graph up or down by any number you want. So a moment ago, we talked about what was similar or different by each, about each function in the family. I want to be a little more precise. It's not just that they have the same shape, but very specifically, each of these functions has the same slope at each x value. For example, at x equals 0, if the derivative is cosine of x, then the slope of our original function has to be cosine of 0, which is just 1. And look at the graph. We can see that that's true. I can sketch little tangent lines which all have x value 0 and slope 1. I could do the same thing at pi over 2. At pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So the slope of all these functions is also 0. We could do the same thing at pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1. And sure enough, each of these functions has a tangent slope, if I sketch it here, that looks like negative 1. Okay, so why are we spending so much time on some things you already know? You already knew that the derivative of sine was cosine and that you could find slopes by looking at tangent lines. Well, if you look at the picture here, the picture of drawing little tangent lines, notice how the black tangent lines kind of give me a hint about the shape of each of the colored lines. We're going to use that idea, the idea of knowing the shape of a function to explore antiderivatives for functions that don't have algebraic antiderivatives. For example, let's suppose I wanted to find a function whose derivative was ln of x. Double check in your brain for a second. ln of x, do we know what that antiderivative is? No, we don't know any function whose derivative is ln of x. But by the fundamental theorem of calculus, there has to be some function that has this derivative. And even though we can't find an equation for that function, except for maybe using an integral, we can sketch what that function would look like. To start, you're going to need a coordinate plane and a function table. 
For this particular skill, it's very, very important that your coordinate plane has approximately even intervals for x and for y. If your graph is skewed, it's going to hurt your slopes. And it's also really useful if you have graph paper. If you don't, you can do what I've done, which is I've just put little dots that indicate each point. So that's 1, 1, that's 1, 2, that's 1, 3, and that's going to be helpful. Great, so now that you're set up, our goal is to graph y. But remember, we don't really know what the y function is. We just know that the derivative of y is ln of x. So I'm going to use my function table to list some possible slopes. For example, if x is negative 1, I can plug negative 1 into the function over here to figure out what the slope should be. Well, it turns out you can't take the natural log of negative 1, so there is no slope. That's kind of a bad example. That's fine. It just means there's no slope at negative 1. Let's try at 0. Well, maybe you have a calculator out or something, but you'll realize pretty quickly you can't do 0 either. But keep trying. And when you plug in 1, we finally get a number. ln of 1 is 0. Here's what that means. Any point on my grid that has an x value of 1 is going to have a slope of 0. Now, I don't know what the true y value of the graph is, which means in order to prepare for any possibility, I'm going to sketch a little tangent line at every point that has an x value of 1. For example, this point has an x value of 1, and I'm going to sketch a tiny little tangent line with a 0 slope. And then this point also has an x value of 1, so I'm going to sketch tangent lines all up and down. And this is actually the start of something called a slope field. Let's repeat the process. In fact, let's check what the slope should be when x equals 2. When I plug in 2 to the ln function, which will tell me the slope, I get 0.693, which is going to be a slope less than 1 but bigger than 0. So now any point on this grid that has an x value of 2, for example, all the points up and down this row, I'm going to sketch a little tangent line, and it's going to have a slightly positive slope. So keep in mind that diagonal, perfectly diagonal, is 1, so I want something shallower than that, which means maybe something a little bit like that. And I'm going to repeat those little slope lines all the way up and down at each point, doing my best to keep each of those slopes the same direction. Let's check 3. So by evaluating the derivative function at 3, I realize the slope is going to be around 1, which means all of these points that have x-coordinates 3 are going to have little slope lines approximately going at a slope of 1, which is a little steeper than the last one, but not terribly steep yet. Finally, we do the same thing for x equals 4, which gives me a slightly steeper slope, and I can go ahead and sketch in those slope lines at every point that has an x value of 4. So what we're looking at now is called a slope field. It's not actually a function. These little lines don't represent the y values or x values of anything. They're just giving me an idea about the shape. And the cool or maybe kind of crazy part is I have no idea what this function is. I can't write an equation for it. But you can kind of get a sense for its shape. Like, I can imagine it being kind of flat here, and then it looks like it's got to curve up a little bit. And in fact, if I knew a starting point, for example, if somebody told me that y equals negative 1 when x is positive 1, then I could take that starting point at 1 negative 1. And starting from that point, I could just follow the directions of the slope field. So I'd start going sideways, and then I'd kind of turn up when it told me to turn up, and then I'd be a little steeper, and then eventually I'd be steeper. And you can kind of follow the lines to get a possible graph. The slope field is your goal for the end of this video. See if you can replicate this process for the two derivative graphs. You should check points from negative 4 to positive 4 for each one. Here's what a could have looked like. Notice the parabola shape, which should be familiar because this is the same graph we started with. And the tangent one's a little bit more complicated. In fact, it's not really clear. The slopes seem to be going up and down. This could be kind of like a sine curve, or it could be that this has an asymptote right here. We don't really have enough information, and that's just the reality of knowing the derivative doesn't tell you everything. We'll wrap it up here for now. And we'll talk some more in class.